The history of man may be far longer and stranger than we think. The Great Pyramid may indeed not fit in with what we believe about the past and the nature of the world. Thousands of years ago, someone measured the earth with remarkable accuracy and recorded this information in the dimensions of the largest and possibly the oldest stone building on the planet, William R. Fix. Generally, the age of the pyramid is given around 4,200 years, it's roughly about the same age as the Sphinx. Some of you are probably familiar with the, however, the redating of the Sphinx by several geologists, primarily Robert Schock from Boston University, who has studied the weathering of the limestone composing the Sphinx and the surrounding quarry that the Sphinx is situated in and has determined that the, uh, that the rock has been severely weathered by water erosion. And of course, the Giza Plateau has been desert for the last 4,000 years, so it's not likely you're going to find severe water erosion on the Sphinx if it's only 4,000 years old. In fact, so severe is the water erosion that it's likely that the Sphinx is probably tens of thousands of years old. However, Robert Schock in most of his public presentations usually places it at seven to 9,000 years, but he's told he personally, he just uses that because he's deliberately being very conservative because he's in the academic community, but he's perfectly willing to believe that it is, could be much older than that. And I've discussed the, the, the extent of the water erosion uh, with him and discovered that he actually hasn't looked uh, in depth at the uh, comparable studies of rates of limestone weathering which uh, I spent a couple of months about 10 years ago studying, going around to various places where there were limestones and where you could see examples of limestone that had been weathered and had looked at, um, uh, read the literature that had been done on limestone weathering and had concluded that you know, it would be a minimum of 20,000 years worth of weathering. And that's a minimum if you took the Sphinx and set it in a, uh, a climate with rainfall like say we've been having for the last three months, which would average out to about 45 inches a year. Even with rainfall like we've been seeing here in Atlanta in the last three months, it would take the Sphinx a minimum of 20 to 30,000 years to get the level of erosion. That raises the question regarding the Great Pyramid. Could it be as old? And I see no reason why not. Problem here though is you know that the Great Pyramid was once covered in white limestone casing stones, highly polished, and according to Arabic traditions, pretty much all the Arabic traditions and legends about the Great Pyramid uh, uh, concur that the outside of the pyramid prior to the stripping of the casing stones was covered, completely covered in hieroglyphs. And one, it just boggles one's mind to contemplate what might have been written there. But Clearly, I, I have a hard time imagining a, a greater act of vandalism in all of history than the stripping of those stones. In fact, there had been efforts to get into the pyramid up until the time of Al-Mamun, which was, I think, around 1200 AD, but they were completely ineffectual. And then somewhere around the 12th century, I've forgotten the exact year, there was a great earthquake in northern Egypt, and it caused most of the buildings in Cairo to collapse, and it also loosened some of the casing stones on the pyramid which allowed them to get in and pry those stones loose from the top. And all of the stones were then stripped off and that high, that indirect high quality limestone was stripped off and recarved and used in buildings to rebuild Cairo. So I've often thought there's probably temples somewhere in Cairo where maybe some of those original stones are still to be found with inscriptions intact. Of course, I have no idea, but I oftentimes thought, wouldn't that be cool? Anyways, they stripped off the stones, and as they stripped them off, there was a lot of rubble that fell down and buried the bottom of the pyramid, which turned out to be a good thing because it buried the bottom casing stones from those bottom and preserved them. And so from those, you know, the various researchers could determine what the original exact angle of the pyramid was. And according to most calculations, it was around 51 degrees, 51 minutes, 14 seconds. I don't know if that level of accuracy is, is credible or not, but 51 minutes, 51 degrees, 51 minutes would be. 
And from there, we can then determine what the geometry of the pyramid would have been and what its original height would have been simply by taking the tangent of, of that angle, 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and knowing the base length, one could calculate what the original height would have been to a high degree of accuracy. So that's been done by, oh, four or five different people over the years. Uh, J.H. Cole in 1925 did what's considered to be the definitive survey of the Great Pyramid. He was a professional survey who did a very meticulous survey after they had just cleared away uh, all of the rubble and he had access to it. He did it uh, under contract to the, to the government of Egypt. The numbers that I'm about to show you here are mostly derived from his survey. So what we have here is here's some of the original casing stones and they sit on a, what's called a sockle, which is this base which was measured to be 55 centimeters in thickness. And, and of course, you've got to bear in mind that this original slope casing stone, there was not, it wasn't stepped like that originally. It was a smooth profile. And let me, okay. So here you have, of course, here you see that the casing stones were damaged by the rubble falling down. But enough of them were still intact that one could make this accurate determination of the original angle. Here's the sockle, which is 55 centimeters thick, and it sits directly on bedrock. So it actually, what it does is it creates two ways that one could measure the height of the pyramid, either with or without the sockle. There's also two ways of measuring the base. This is a reconstruction from uh, a 1991 work on uh, ferronic stonemasonry. And this shows that outside the corners, which was the, the core masonry, there are these sockets. And I found one picture showing a socket. This is showing one of the sockets that's still there that sits outside the core masonry. But based on those sockets, they were able to reconstruct what the original base of the pyramid would have looked like. So here would have been the 51 degrees, 51 minutes, coming down, sitting on the 55 centimeter thick sockle here, like this. Well, what this did was it gave two ways of measuring the perimeter of the pyramid's base. One could be measured from this point up on top of the sockle. The other could be measured from down here that included the sockle. So what you ended up with was two ways of measuring the pyramid's base. Well, which one was the correct one? Well, they were both correct. I think that they were actually intending to embody in there that there were two ways of measuring uh, the pyramid's base. So what we have is the length of the base on the sockle, which is the shorter of the two up there. It was varied from side to side. You'll notice 755 at the smallest to 756 just over at the largest. So there was some variation. There was probably a reason for that variation, actually, um, but we won't get into that because it just gets too technical for what we're talking about today. But the total of those measured around the four sides would be 3,023.139 feet. If you're taking notes, that'd be a good number to write down. Okay, so now let's see what the measure is around that includes the sockle or the base. And we see that it's, each side is a roughly five feet longer, 760 to 761. Each side, again, is a little different, but we get a total of 3,043.433 feet. So I'm going to, over here, I'm going to write down a few numbers that we saw through our radius of the moon, diameter of the moon, uh, radius of the sun, diameter of the sun, Number of seconds in a day would be 432,000, 43,200. Uh, number of seconds in a half a day, number of seconds in a full day, 86,400. What were some of our more other numbers? Oh, yeah, 1440 was one, 7920. Diameter of the Earth, just so they're up there in front of you, we can refer to them as we go on here. All right. So here is profile the Great Pyramid with a 51 degree, 51 minute angle. I've just, to make it easy, I've just rounded off the numbers, 481 feet in height. That would be not including the, the sockle, the base. 755.85, I just picked one to use. Um, 
And there's our 51 degree, 51 minute angle. And we find that when we measure, measure it this way, it turns out to be almost exactly 11 over 7. There's some other interesting geometry going on related to the golden section, which I don't intend to get into today because it makes more sense if you're actually studying sacred geometry and you're familiar and you've made these drawings. Because in a sacred geometry class, just like in the old Pythagorean and Platonic lodges, we draw, we draw, we draw, and then we eventually build models. And that's the way to really get familiar with this and get these numbers as part of your consciousness. I'm not going to get into the connection with the golden section today. When we measure including the socle, this becomes our height, 482.7575 feet, and the base, 760.9 feet. Okay, those are the numbers we're going to look at for a second here now. If we look at these, these are various estimates. We're, we're looking at um, this one right here, the coal height estimate plus the socle at 21.6 inches gives a total of the height above bedrock of 482.7575 feet. Let me write that down here. 482.7575 and I'm going to write 760 plus being the measure of the base. So again, total perimeter of casing stones on the socle. I should probably write that down too. Let me just get another page. 3,023. And the other one was 3,043. So we've got those two numbers. We'll come back to those. I've written them there. Let's see, 3,043.433. Let's be exact. All right. So now we're going to go back to the earth so we can see how these numbers link the two. We take one square degree of latitude and longitude at the equator. Pretend we're standing at the equator. Okay, we know that the polar radius now is 13 miles less than the equatorial radius. So what that means is that the circle this way is shorter in the circle, the biggest circle that defines the Earth is the equatorial circle. So a degree of measure on the equator is going to be the biggest, the longest of any degree we measure anywhere on the Earth, the equator. Okay, the north-south is going to be a little bit shorter. And you'll notice right there, we've got 68.7 miles north to south and 69.17 east to west. So it's not a perfectly square unit, is it? It's a little bit distorted. Well, that distortion is totally significant because it's that distortion that is a measure of the Earth's departure from being a perfect sphere. And it's that departure of a perfect sphere that is very significant to us because without that, again, Earth's orbital stability would be, would be non-existent. Okay, so we're going to divide this up a little bit. If we take this square degree of, of latitude north to south, longitude east to west, and we look very carefully down in the lower right-hand corner, you're going to see something, a little square. You see that little square? That represents one minute, one-sixtieth of the degree this way, one-sixtieth of the degree this way. So that's one minute of latitude and longitude. All right, we're going to take a closer look at that, and we will see that one minute then is 6,045.881 north to south, 6,087 east to west, which is what we expect. The east-west should be a little bit longer, and that's one square minute of latitude and longitude. Okay, now we're going to divide each of those lengths into two. We're going to divide our square minute into one-fourth sections. And here's what I want you to notice. When we do that, we take one-fourth of a square minute of latitude and longitude, look at our dimension east to west, and look at our dimension north to south. And look at these two numbers. In fact, 
here's, here's an accurate calculation. We take the 482.755 feet, which is the height, and what we discover is that if we multiply that by the number 43,200, which is one of our sacred numbers that we've seen right there, 43,200, it shows up in the Vedas and the Sumerian king lists, et cetera, et cetera. If we multiply the height of the pyramid by that number, this is what we come out with, 3,949.83 miles. And notice the difference between the pyramid, which I call the standard polar radius, and World Grid System 72 is only 313 feet over the entire size of the Earth. So we have essentially the pyramid being a scale model of the Earth, the northern hemisphere, at a scale of 43,200 to 1. If we take the pyramid, enlarge it by 43,200, its height, including the socle, now becomes the polar radius of the Earth within 300 feet of our satellite surveys. And then the two measures of the base are exactly the difference between the east-west difference and the north-south difference at a square of minute at the equator. So they were able to, now the skeptic and the reductionist would dismiss this and say, ah, it's just a coincidence, you're just playing with numbers. And I would say, okay, you know, you can believe what you want, but it's there, the numbers are there. You can take the surveys of Egypt by coal, you can take the geodetic surveys, I didn't make those numbers up or I didn't fudge them, and what you discover is that when you expand it by 43,200, which, you know, if, if, if the number was just some arbitrary number, but it turns out that the, the uh, factor of expansion to, turns out to be one of the critical sacred numbers within the ancient systems. And so here we have the pyramid now enlarged by 43,200 times. And, th and another way to think of it is if we go back to this diagram right here, you'll see that as the earth turns, every half second it's going to turn this far. So it means that every two seconds the earth, if you're standing on the equator, in two seconds the earth has turned 143,200 part of its total orbit. So if you're standing on the equator in two seconds precisely, the Earth has turned an ex a distance exactly equal to the distance around the, great, the base of the Great Pyramid. Now you can dismiss that as being coincidence, but the numbers don't lie. They're there. And so when William R. Fix was saying that someone somewhere thousands of years ago was able to measure the Earth with great precision, and I haven't, of course, elaborated upon all the details of this. I just, I'm trying to give you the, the overall picture of how it might have worked. Um, referring back to our geodetic data, if we look at the various ellipsoids that give the polar radius and then we take each of those polar radii going from all of these ellipsoids down the Clark ellipsoid has been the one of 1880 has been the one used in, in the United States for all non-military and non-NASA related measurements. We still use on a day-to-day basis. If you if you take a topographic map, you know, and you're going out like a, a 7.5 quadrangle and you're going out navigating with a topographic map put up by the U.S. Geological Survey, they're using the Clark ellipsoid right there. But you'll notice that when we take these various polar radii lengths in uh, feet and divide them by 43,200, you can see the numbers we get right here. Remember, the height of the pyramid is estimated at 482.7575. So looking at this, what you'd see on here, which one would be the closest? Well, you notice it's come out very, very close to the, to the satellite surveys. Given that it's very pot, and see, when you you've got to ask yourself, well, why is there a difference between this, the satellite survey of 72 and the satellite survey of 80? Well, if we did another one again with as high a degree of accuracy, we would discover there's still going to be a discrepancy. And the reason is, is that the Earth spinning through space, there are various tidal forces working on the Earth which are constantly causing it to distort its shape by up to two or three or four or five hundred feet. 
So we never would be able to get more accurate than three or 400 feet because the Earth itself is changing shape. And if we were to measure it every year for the next 10 years, we would get 10 different numbers. They'd all be very close, but they would deviate somewhat because the Earth itself, there are tidal bulges. You know, where's the moon relative to the Earth? That's going to affect. If the moon and the sun are on the same side of the Earth, that will affect the shape of the Earth up to being several hundred feet measured over the diameter of the Earth. And so it is not a miss to say that the pyramid enshrines a measure of the Earth that could be considered as accurate as those determined by modern satellite surveys. That to me is a very profound insight. Because it does suggest that somebody, once upon a time, was able to measure the Earth's size and shape with that level of precision. And if they were able to do that, what's the implication of that? See, that's, that's the interesting part. Because no primitive culture, using the method of Eratosthenes in about 300 BC in Greece, he measured the Earth and was generally considered to be quite accurate because he was able to get the uh, circumference of the Earth within about 500 miles of its actual measured circumference by using the methods available to the ancient Greeks, you see. And he, and he was considered to be the first to measure by, by basically putting a stick in the ground and measuring the angle of the shadow uh, on the longest day of the year over a couple of successive years. That's actually an, an exercise we do in the sacred geometry class because it's very interesting how he did that. But he was considered to be you know, pretty proficient because he was able to determine that the uh, size of the Earth was, the circumference of the Earth was you know, 25,000 miles when it's generally considered to be about 24,800 depending on where you measure it. So he was you know, maybe, with, maybe within 50 miles of the actual d dimension of the Earth. But nowhere near as close as the pyramid would have been. So again, if the, even if the pyramid was built 4,200 years ago, you know, you got to say who 4,200 years ago had the technology to measure the Earth with that degree of accuracy. Now, to, that we know of, nobody 4,200 years ago did, or how they would have done it, we don't know. But on the other hand, if it turns out that the pyramid could be much older, it leads us back to the, you know, going back 10,000 or 20,000 years. This to me is one of those little, um, oh, sort of like the, the little crack in the dike that if you don't keep it plugged, the whole edifice of contemporary knowledge could get swept away. Because we can't acknowledge that somebody 10,000 or 20,000 years ago was scientifically sophisticated. That was the days of Cro-Magnon man and Alley-oop living in the cave and so forth. Cavemen, which is a silly idea actually. Yes, I'm sure people did take refuge in caves when uh, things got really crazy out here. Yes, I think people did take refuge in caves. But see, this is one of those things, again, that if you accept that it's not just a coincidence, it opens up a whole can of worms that mainstream science generally doesn't want to address. Because we're the epitome of scientific evolution right here and now, right? Nobody before we built satellites could have measured the Earth to within a couple of hundred feet of its actual dimensions. So, given two seconds of time, 143,200th part of the daily rotation, a point on the equator will travel a distance precisely equal to the perimeter of the Great Pyramid's base as measured with the socle. In one half second of time, a point on the equator will rotate a distance equal to one side of the base of the Great Pyramid measured with the socle. So here you have a time and space measure integrated into one. The time measure comes in because it's the span of time that the Earth has moved. In two seconds, the Earth has turned and moved a distance within a fraction of an inch, being the distance around the base of the Great Pyramid. And so the height of the Great Pyramid measured, pyramid measured with the socle is 143,200th part of the Earth's polar radius. So therefore, the Great Pyramid is a model of one hemisphere of the Earth at a scale of 1 to 43,200. So if we took the Great Pyramid and we created the duplicate and turned it upside down and put the two together base to base, that would now give us the polar diameter. 
And there's something else that's beyond uh, the scope of today's talk, which we get into in, in an actual sacred geometry class. And this is looking how the pyramid is also the solution of the squaring of the circle, the ancient pro geometry problem of the classical world, the squaring of the circle. And that has very important implications for understanding the Great Pyramid as a three-dimensional map of the Earth. Because the, the, the Great Pyramid's square base is to its height exactly in the same relation as the radius of a circle is to the circumference of a circle. So you could picture that what's happening there, that means that in all maps you have a line of constant uh, proportion, a line of, of where, where the scale, you know that all maps that you look at, there will be somewhere on the map where you have an accurate scaling. And as you move away from that line of, of accurate scaling, the maps become distorted. Well, if, you're, if you've got a square and a circle of equal perimeter, you see the Earth's equator, think of as the circle, and you think of this pyramid being enlarged 43,200 times, its square base is now the same distance around as the Earth's equator, right? So if you're mapping from the arc, the circular arc that's the Earth's equator, taking that and flattening it out and now mapping it onto the base of the pyramid, the 43,200 times bigger pyramid, it's going to be exactly the same length. So there's going to be no distortion around the perimeter of the pyramid's base and the height of the pyramid, which is exactly the polar radius of the Earth. So that, from, from the standpoint of cartographic information, that partic the particular geometry of the pyramid is very relevant because it is the solution to the squaring of the circle problem, which is something we study extensively in a sacred geometry curriculum. One more example the Parthenon to show that this geodetic knowledge was still extant down to the time of the building of the Parthenon about 2400 years ago. This is the east facade. We're all familiar with the Parthenon. It's almost as well known as the Great Pyramid. Well, if we measure its base in the manner that I'm showing here, it's 100 Greek feet. So how long was a Greek foot? A little bit longer than our modern foot of 12 inches. Before we do that, let's look at the dimensions of the Parthenon. Based upon our American feet that we use, the east facade is 101.2957 dot 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 feet. So if we divide that by 100, we get the length of the Greek foot, which would have been 1.0129, etc., of our American which are actually the Eng British feet. Okay, I better write that down so we don't forget it. That's good enough right there. There's the width of the Parthenon measured in our American feet. And uh, also notice the latitude of Athens, where the, where the Parthenon is located, is 37 degrees, 58 minutes north. And I'm going to write that down, 37 degrees, 58 minutes. So it's almost, almost 38 degrees north. And here we have based upon numerical and proportional relationships augmented by extensive analysis of ancient structures, artifacts, and texts. Stachini, who was considered one of the preeminent metrologists of the 20th century, he determined various lengths of the foot. He came up with the Greek foot of 1.0114064. Now notice here we've got the width of the east facade of the Parthenon divided by 100 gives a Greek foot of 1.0129 1 .1, for a difference of 0 0.018 inch in excess of the length of the Greek foot as calculated by Stichini. It is acknowledged by architectural historians that the Parthenon was originally built to be 100 Greek feet in width. This would have made it equal to 101.14 English feet when built. Now if we go back to the length of one degree of the meridian, and we look right here at the latitude of Athens, we find something very interesting. Length of one degree of the meridian at the latitude of Athens 
is 68.962 miles or 364,121.647 feet. So if we take that number, divide it by 60, gives us the length of one minute of meridian arc. Then we divide that meridian arc by 60, it gives us one second of meridian arc. And notice what one second of meridian arc is, 101.1449 feet. So one second of meridian arc at 38 degrees north latitude, given the international ellipsoid and the Clark ellipsoid, you'll know here that it's exact. So in other words, what we have there, the total difference in length of one second of meridian arc at 38 degrees north latitude and the east facade of the Parthenon is 0 0.05 inch. But again, that's for 38 north latitude and it's actually at 37.58. So if we make that adjustment of two minutes of arc south, this 0 0.05 pretty much just disappears into nothing. So what we have is the Parthenon, again, maybe coincidence, but here we have the Parthenon being precisely one second of arc of the Earth's circumference at that latitude that it's placed. Now again, that implies somebody was able to measure the Earth with incredible precision, if this isn't a coincidence. And I think the burden of proof would be on the person who tries to dismiss this as being coincidental. Because the two examples I've shown you here could be multiplied many times over. We haven't even talked about the Gothic cathedrals and the fact that every Gothic cathedral was built with its own cubit. And that cubit is based upon a multiple or a subdivision of the meridian length at the latitude that the cathedral was built. So you could take many examples of this and what I'm suggesting here is not necessarily that the Gothic cathedral builders of 800 years ago were able to measure the earth with that accuracy. But then again, it does seem to imply that somebody was, that somebody was able to measure the earth, that maybe there has been a tradition going back to who knows when from the building of the pyramids, coming down through the, the age of the Greeks, right down to the building of the Gothic, European Gothic cathedrals 800 years ago, a tradition of very sophisticated geodetic knowledge. Well, again, this, this opens up a huge can of worms about when people were supposed to, what they knew and when they were supposed to have learned it. 